Hello, my name is Rex McLean and I'd like to welcome you to the Sunday School lesson for the week of April the 19th from the Bible Studies for Life material. Last week the lesson was entitled, The Truth of the Resurrection. This week we will be looking at why the resurrection matters. And we will be uh, in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, but I'll, I'll remind you of that again in a minute. But I want to start with, there's a term that we use in our society that we call a game changer. And that term refers to an invention or an event that changes the way that we live or work. Uh, our Sunday School book mentions a few of these from many years ago, one being the printing press, another being the battery, uh, another one it mentions is the electric light, and obviously the, the relevance to that is this week we've, quite a few of us have been without electric lights, so that really is a game changer when you, when you get it back on. Uh, some of the more modern game changers that we've had in, in more recent times are the events of 9-11, which completely changed the way that we travel and move through airports. Uh, the coronavirus pandemic that we're experiencing right now has obviously changed the way that we gather together for Sunday school or worship service, uh, along with many other things. Uh, on a lighter note, one of, the, one of the more modern game changers that I'm a huge fan of is the little green era that gives you the right of way to make a left turn across a busy highway. And needless to say, some of us may not be where we are now if it weren't for that little green arrow because we would probably still be sitting in the turn lane. But nonetheless, but with all that being said, there was, an, uh, there was a game-changing event that happened a little over 2,000 years ago. That event was the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And that will be our focal point today. And today we were going to see what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, and hopefully we will see that because Jesus lives, we can too. And how that should affect how we approach each day. So we will begin in chapter 15 of 1 Corinthians. We'll be starting in verse 20 and 22, verse 20 through 22. And the scripture says, But as it is, Christ has been raised from the dead the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since death came through a man, the resurrection of the dead also comes through a man. For just as in Adam all die, so also in Christ all will be made alive. So let's go back a few verses from, from where that began to verse 14. And the Living Bible puts it this way, And if he is still dead, then all of our preaching is useless. And your trust in God is empty, worthless, and hopeless. One more verse we'll look at prior to, to what our uh, lesson starts at is verse 19 of chapter 15. And it says, And if being a Christian is of value to us only in this life, we are the most miserable of creatures. But Paul assures us of the reality of it all at the beginning of verse 20 when he said, but as it is, Christ has been raised from the dead. So Paul uses, also uses the term first fruits in that verse. And the first fruits is a reference to Leviticus 23, when the children of Israel would bring the first of their harvest and present it to the priest as a symbol of their dependence upon God that the rest of their crop would be bountiful. That's similar to what we do with our tithes and offerings in this day and time when we, when we give the first of our uh, income that we receive. And we do that knowing that, as the old saying goes, that God can do more with the 90% than we can do with the 100%. So that, it's similar to that. But I think the picture that Paul is trying to paint here is that Jesus is the first of the resurrection showing that we can have absolute confidence that God will raise those of us who are believers from the dead as well. 
that's kind of like as the as the children of Israel would give their the beginning of their harvest to the priest is dependent upon God. The the resurrection of Christ is in a sense God's pledge is probably more than in a sense. It's, it's God's pledge or promise to us that we will also be raised in the end. So there was a a conversation between Jesus and Martha, the mother of, of uh, not the mother, but the brother of Lazarus, that Jesus and Martha were having. And Jesus said to her in John chapter 11, verse 25, Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. And Jesus spoke these words many years before Paul wrote 1 Corinthians. So you could see how the Bible always ties in with itself, and it never contradicts itself. So looking at verse 21 and 22 that we read a second ago, they kind of remind me of Romans 3.23 and John 3.16 if they were all wrapped up into one verse. Because back to 21 and 22, it says, For since death came through a man, the resurrection of the dead also comes through a man, that man being Adam. For just as in Adam all die, so also in Christ all will be made alive. Romans 3.23 says this, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And then we all know what John 3.16 says. One of the most famous quoted verses of the Scripture says, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whoever believes in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. So in other words, sin reaches far and wide, but God's love for us demonstrated through the crucifixion and the resurrection reaches farther and wider. So now we can see that Christ's resurrection makes our own resurrection possible. How do we see that? We base that on the Scripture and what the Scripture says in our faith that, that the Scripture is true. So the, the next few verses in our lesson today, we're, we're continuing in verse 15, or chapter 15, verse 23 through 28 says, But each in his own order, Christ, the firstfruits, Afterward, at His coming, those who belong to Christ. Then comes the end when He hands over the kingdom to God the Father, when He abolishes all rule and all authority and power, for He must reign until He puts all His enemies under His feet. The last enemy to be abolished is death, for God has put everything under His feet. Now when He says everything is put under Him, it is obvious that He who puts everything under Him is the exception. When everything is subject to Christ, then the Son Himself will also be subject to the One who subjected everything to Him so that God may be all in all. There's two really important things to remember about the resurrection. Number one is it wasn't just anyone who was raised from the dead. It was God incarnate. Yes, Jesus was 100% man, and 100% God when He walked on this earth, and He is still 100% God. Number two is that Jesus' power over death proves He is the Lord of all. Uh, during Jesus' ministry on earth, He made multiple claims by what He said and what He did as to who He was, much to the dismay of the religious leaders of that time. Uh, a few of those things that, that Christ did while on this earth is, number one, He forgave sins. And we will see in John chapter 9, verses 2 through 6, the Scripture, well, actually it's Matthew chapter 9, verses 2 through 6. The Scripture says, Then behold, they brought to Him a paralytic lying on a bed. When Jesus saw their faith, He said to the paralytic, Son, be of good cheer, your sins are forgiven you. And at once, some of the scribes said within themselves, This man blasphemes. But Jesus, knowing their thoughts, said, Why do you think evil in your hearts? For which is easier to say, Your sins are forgiven you, or to say, Arise and walk? But, with, 
but that you may know that the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins. Then he said to the paralytic, Arise, take up your bed, and go to your house. And he arose and departed to his house. Uh, that was one thing. He forgave sins. He identified himself as the Lord of the Sabbath. In Matthew chapter 12, verse 8, and the scripture says, For the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. And as the creator of heaven and earth, Jesus was far greater than the Sabbath, uh, a day instituted to remember his work of creation. Jesus is Lord of all, and the Sabbath was intended to honor him. That's why he made that claim. Number three is he knew people's innermost thoughts. We saw that a while ago during the, the forgiveness of the sins and the healing of the paralytic. But in Matthew chapter 12, verse 25, uh, verse, we'll start with verse 24. It says, Now when the Pharisees heard it, they said, This fellow does not cast out demons except by Beelzebub, the ruler of the demons. But Jesus knew their thoughts and said to them, Every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation, and every city or house divided against itself will not stand. And the fourth thing that I have kind of written down here he said he even claimed to be one with the father and that is in John chapter 10 verse 30 where he said exactly what I said he said I and my father are one and that one really did not sit well with the uh, with his adversaries of the day and you know that by the next the very next verse it says then the Jews took up stones again to stone him so the question is, why is the resurrection so important? Without the resurrection, those claims and those actions that Christ performed while he was on earth would be exactly that, just claims. There would be nothing to back them up. But because of the reality of the resurrection, all of the previous claims that we just spoke of have been proven true, and now he can claim his authority over death. Who else can claim that? Who else can claim the authority over death but Jesus Christ? His resurrection proves that he is Lord of all. So as we continue with the scripture, we remain in, verse, in chapter 15, but we're moving on to the, the latter verses of the chapter. We'll start in verse 54, and we'll read from 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 54 through 58. When this corruptible body is clothed with incorruptibility, and this mortal body is clothed with immortality, then the saying that is written will take place, death has been swallowed up in victory. Where death, where death is your victory, where death is your sting. The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Remember that verse. Therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, be steadfast and movable, always excelling in the Lord's work, because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. So up to this point, Paul has reminded us, in case that there was any doubt, that the resurrection of Jesus is a reality, an event that actually happened. We know in last week's lesson, we were in 1 Corinthians also, uh, chapter 15, there was uh, many witnesses, many eyewitnesses that actually saw Christ after the resurrection. And, but because of that, because of that being the resurrection, he is who he has always claimed to be, the Lord of all. So we read earlier that Jesus' resurrection ensures our resurrection. And Scripture teaches us that when we come to Jesus for salvation, that we should come just as we are. We even sometimes sing the old hymn, Just As I Am. But praise God for those of us who have been 
saved by the blood of Jesus Christ, we are not going to heaven just like we are. And Paul makes mention of that in these verses. Paul says in verse 53, which is, uh, precedes these verses that I just read, for this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. In other words, this body that we look into the mirror and see every day could not handle what God has in store for us in heaven. Therefore, we will be changed. And as a Christian, if, if you've been alive for any time at all, more than five minutes, then you know that sin and death surrounds us every day. Even Christians find themselves caught up in things that they, they don't want to be in, uh, doing things that they shouldn't be doing. Even Paul mentioned uh, that he, he would do the things that he didn't want to do and didn't do the things that he needed, that he knew he needed to do. But we get caught up in sin sometimes. And we have witnessed many Christian friends and family who have, who have died. So we know that sin and death surrounds us every day of our lives. But, but the good news is, and the Bible is full of good news, it's, it's, that's what it is, is when Jesus returns, we will no longer experience sin or death. I don't know about you, but I'm looking very forward to that day. So let's look again at verse 57. When I was reading, I told you to remember that verse. If you look in the Baptist hymnal, which is a favorite book of mine, on page 426, you will find the song, Victory in Jesus. Right under the title, you will see this verse, which is verse 57. It says, but thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. You will find that verse as a, as a reference as the inspiration for this song. And I, I, I thought that was uh, an interesting little side note to that because you got to love the theology of the old hymns. And uh, most of them are based strictly from Scripture with a lot of Scripture references to them. But I thought that was interesting about, about that verse. Uh, when, you, when you read the many writings of Paul in the New Testament, and there are quite a few of them, one thing you will notice is that Paul never forgets to be thankful. A few months ago, we had a Sunday school lesson uh, about God's faithfulness. And the, the theme of that whole lesson was that sometimes we forget to remember. We forget to remember how faithful God is to us. But Paul has a reputation of never forgetting to be thankful. And you'll see that throughout his writings. And right on cue, he reminds the Corinthian believers, as well as us who are reading this uh, today, to give thanks to God who gives us the victory through Jesus Christ our Lord. So as a believer, if you ever think that you're struggling to find something to be thankful for and and I'm sure there are times when we all do. Uh, just go back and read verse 57 of 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And I believe it, it may put a smile on your face. So I'm uh, some people think that Paul could have ended chapter 15 with verse 57. And actually, that wouldn't have been a bad verse to end with. Uh, Matter of fact, you could end almost every chapter of the Bible with that verse. But not Paul. Paul, Paul wouldn't want to end there because just as I said, he never forgets to be thankful. He also never misses a good opportunity to exhort and encourage the believers that he is writing to. And this time he is encouraging them and us. I heard a preacher say one time, the Bible wasn't necessarily written to us but it was written for us. And, and you'll see that in a statement I'll make in a minute. But this time he is encouraging them and us 
to be steadfast or firm in our beliefs, to be immovable or not swaying in, in what we believe and, and the convictions that we have, and excelling in the Lord's work in all that God has called us to do. So what a great exhortation from Paul to us as believers today. And when Paul wrote these words, as we kind of wind this lesson up, when Paul wrote these words to the church at Corinth, he had no idea, and I'm not sure that I did either, that in April of 2020, that we would be reading them as if he had written them to us. And it, it always amazes me how the scripture, no matter how long ago it was written, and what the circumstances were that it was written under, it always seems to be current and up to date to the questions and concerns that we have today. So the point of this lesson, really just the, the theme of this lesson, the point was the resurrection of Christ changes everything. And my hope is that based on what we have read today, that as a believer, you can honestly say that there's never been a truer statement. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for your love and your mercy and your grace that you give to us that we're so undeserving of. And Father, we thank you for the reminder that we have in the scripture of the resurrection that defeated death and gives us life. And we thank you again for uh, the blood of Jesus Christ that was shed on that cross. And we ask all these things in Christ's name. Amen.